and a very good morning to you this beautiful autumn day. Don't you think that Hillsboro is one of the best kept secrets in this part of North Carolina? I love Airmont, the old uh, Scottish home from Ayr, Scotland, the sixth son of um, a family immigrated here to trade with the Indians. And since there's a trade route between uh, Petersburg, Virginia, and Salisbury, North Carolina, an old Indian path, he came here to trade with them and got really wealthy for his day. Have you ever seen the old sunken road that's still left? Uh, you can see it on Airmont's property. It sunk about maybe 12 feet into the ground. Really worth seeing. And then, of course, uh, on the hill above Hillsboro, where the school board is now, that's where they took the regulators that they captured during the, the Battle of Alamance. And they were going to hang all ten of them, but they ended up hanging five and letting the other five go as an act of mercy. And one of the best-kept secrets of this area are the Okanichi Indians. Do any of you know Chief John Blackfeather? What a delightful man he is. Former United States Marine, was ashamed of his Indian heritage, he told me, till he was in his 40s. His mother always said, shh, don't tell people you're an Indian, they'll be prejudiced against you. But he became proud and studied out his heritage and uh, is a remarkable man. He knows the history of the Indians in this region better than anybody I have ever met. And then there's Riverwalk. 26 miles of trails to walk on. What a delight. And some of the best restaurants in the area. And of course the Hillsboro Inn is here. And at the Arrowhead, uh, Daniel Boone met some of the regulators who had sold their property for whatever they could get and were traveling over the mountains against King George's wishes to a place they call Kentuck, the Cumberland Gap. And this was the place where you met him and it started. Uh, the Cumberland Gap was originally a game trail. The animals went through there. And of course the Indians following the animals for food uh, made an even deeper trail out of it. And somebody taught the trail to Daniel Boone. It was one of the only places within a 500 mile radius where you could get a Conestoga wagon over the Appalachian Mountains into Kentucky without getting stuck or without it being too steep for the oxen to, to, bring, to bring it up. The Presbyterian Meeting House in Hillsboro is the oldest Presbyterian building still standing in North Carolina. And it was on that site after the American Revolution that the Assembly of North Carolina voted whether or not to join the United States and put themselves under the Constitution. And much to the surprise of the other 13 colonies, we voted no. Do you know why? I had taken a group of Chinese visiting professors on a walking tour of Hillsboro, and I showed them the meeting house, and I said, here's where we met and voted not to become a part of the United States because we didn't have a Bill of Rights. And they said, we're not putting our neck in the noose of any constitution that doesn't guarantee our rights. And of course the Chinese said, what are the Bill of Rights? And boy, that takes you back to school if you still get to study that today. The right to bear arms, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, trial by jury, freedom of assembly, so on and so forth. And I remember one of the Chinese history professors looked at me and said, Pastor Kratz, in China, we people have none of those rights. Well, I knew that, but I didn't know it, and it kind of rocked me. But I showed him where Mr. Hooper is, who was one of the local signers of the Declaration of Independence. Some say his body's been moved under the statue of Nathaniel Green at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Frankly, there's probably a little bit of him buried in both places. But we have one of the few signers of the Declaration of Independence here. Catherine and I, uh, during the pandemic, on a pretty day, walked through some of the cemeteries like your pastor has been doing in Boston. And there was one particular 
grave that stood out to us because on it were these words. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Yea, blessed indeed, saith the Lord. They rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That happens to be a direct quotation of John from the book of Revelation. We were amazed from the 1860s on up to about the 1940s or 50s how Christ-centered so many of the grave markers were. Now, since then, they become without Bible verses, the cross isn't on them. They're just memorial markers. But before that, people really wanted you to visit their grave and see that they had a shining faith in Jesus Christ. And I took an interest in this verse and began to study it to see why an earlier Christian here in Hillsboro marveled at that passage. And I have come away loving it very deeply myself. So let's take a look at it today. This is not only the time of year when the leaves uh, turn beautiful and teach us that letting go and death can be okay because there's a spring coming, a resurrection. And it's the typical time of the church year in the end of October when we celebrate All Saints Day, the security of the dead in the presence of Christ. Uh, Halloween is a contraction of all of the, the eve of all the hallowed ones. Uh, the feast of Saturnella and the feast of Samhain, a cult feast, are in this time of year when the sun seems to be leaving us and fertility ends and the crops, you either have them in by then or the frost kills them. And our forefathers were terrified that they had peeved God in some way and he was withdrawing the sun from us and they would not only freeze to death, they would live in darkness. We haven't had power in our house for the last three days because of the hurricane. And it gets dark around here this time of year. And it's cold in a house without heat this time of year. And you can imagine the Druids terrified that they had peeved the gods somehow. So they lit huge bonfires on the tops of mountains to say, See there, Mr. Sun, we're like you. We're friendly. You have a welcome here. So when Christianity was brought by the early missionaries into Europe, they confronted the terrifying prospect of death that the Druids had and the fear of Samhain, the, de the devil who would possess them. And so they chose Halloween, or the eve of all the hallowed ones, to teach on death and to teach people the security of the dead in Christ in heaven. They're beyond the reach of the grave, beyond decay, beyond the reach of Samhain or Satan, and they're secure for all eternity. Well, I'm not going to be preaching here on All Saints Day, so I'm going to rush it a little bit, and let's celebrate the security of the dead in the presence of the Lord. Now look at the text, if you will. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. The word blessed can be translated as beatific or in a perfect state of joy or some translations just call it happy. So you could translate it, happy are the dead. Now that's what we call in English an oxymoron, an oxymoronic statement. I give my right arm to be ambidextrous. That's oxymoronic. Or she's pretty ugly. Which is it? She's pretty or she's ugly? Or, you know, you get confused by that. And to say happy are the dead. Happiness and dead don't belong in the same sentence. But there's a qualifier. Happy are the dead who die in the Lord. In Haiti, when somebody who is a part of the voodoo tribe dies, the witch doctor comes and he takes the bone of a dead man, usually a femur if he can get it, and he puts it in the head of the freshly deceased and clutching that bone, the dead go through life to death and it becomes a kind of passport into the voodoo world beyond. Well, I'm not going to put a dead man's bone in your head this morning. I want to put this text in your head. 
Happy or blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. I'm not usually an eavesdropper, but I was in a cafe recently, and there were some women up in years talking about how they'd like to die. And it was one of these wine and cheese parties for some of the wealthy, older, yuppie women in the area. And after the second glass of wine, you didn't have to eavesdrop. They were very animated, and you could hear what they all were saying. And they were talking about how they wanted to die. And one woman said, I want to die in my own home. Just one more peek at all my stuff. Another one, before Hurricane Ian, obviously, said she wanted to die in Florida. It was the only place she ever gets warm. Another lady said, I don't want to die in the spring. One more peek at the flowers, you know. And another lady said, I want to die in the money. I want to die in Las Vegas, rolling the dice, pulling the lever, and winning a fortune and falling over and leaving it to my children. Well, there was another lady that was kind of quiet and wasn't saying anything, and she was the last one, and for the longest time, she just sat there, smiled, and then she said, in the money, in spring, at home or in Florida, none of that really matters to me. When I die, I want to be in the Lord. That's the only thing that really matters. If you die in your own strength, if you die in your own religious efforts to redeem yourself, you're not dying in the Lord. But if you die having transferred all your hope of redemption and a future life into the Lord Jesus Christ, then that's security indeed. Is that rain falling? Oh, such a gentle sound. Maybe it's the heat. How beautiful. You, you, when your power's off, you are sensitive to noise. <laughs> Anything that's running. <laughs> My goodness. There are three great fears that human beings have. One of our greatest fears is that we will be corrupted and embarrassed by our sins and condemned. A second great fear is the fear of defeat, that we won't solve our problems, that we'll die miserably as ornery old people filled with horrible habits and sin. And the third great fear is annihilation, that we will die and suffer oblivion or the rages of hell. And it's interesting that the gospel of Jesus Christ touches all three of those fears. The fear of being condemned is solved by the justification by faith in Jesus Christ. He stood before me as a sinner before God that I can stand before the same God as Jesus in his righteousness. There was a divine exchange, my weakness for his strength my unrighteousness for his righteousness. That transference is what we call the propitiation of sin in the New Testament or the divine atonement. And the justification of Christ teaches me I will not be condemned. I am forgiven. Now what about being defeated by our sins? Well, beyond justification, there's another cation word called sanctification. The good work he began in you, Philippians says, he'll bring to completion at that day. Or Paul wrote, we are being changed moment by moment from our evilness to his likeness. It does not yet appear what we shall be like, but when he appears, we'll be like him. And that cleaning us up or sanctifying us from sin is a wonderful word. And that process is going on and it will be brought to completion will not be torn asunder by condemnation or defeated by our sins. And then the third great fear is the fear of oblivion or annihilation. And Jesus said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. 
Now, think about that for a moment. Jesus is saying in heaven, he's creating a place for us, a new heaven and a new earth. Scripture teaches that God created heaven and earth that we so love and enjoy around us in seven days, six days actually, seventh day he rested of Genesis time, however you understand that. But notice in John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. He has been working on heaven for over 2,000 years. And the point is, if you like what he made in six days, do you think you might not really like what he made in 2,000 years? And scripture says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has thought entered the mind of man of the wonderfulness of what he's created for those who love him and put their trust in him. So blessed are those who die in the Lord. They're not condemned, they're not defeated, they're not going to be annihilated, they're going to be with Jesus. Now the key here is what does it mean to be in the Lord? I love that song we sang earlier. It might look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by the Lord. He is in us and he is all around us. I think of a hot day in August and you go to the swimming pool. There's some people who lather themselves with sunscreen and sit on a chase lounge about 10 feet from the edge of the water, but they never get in it. They maybe get a little splash on them every now and then. Then there are others who sit on the edge of the pool and dangle their feet in the water, and they might get wet up to the edge of their bathing suit, but never their hair or their makeup. And then there are others who get in the water and they walk around the shallow pool but never over their head or out of their control. But then there's a person who gets in the pool. He lets go of the side. He doesn't worry about gravity. He believes in the buoyancy of water. And he jumps in the deep end. And he's there immersed in the water. What it means to be in Jesus is not unlike that. It's to transfer all of the weight of your sin into the water of his mercy. And just be there, surrounded, not by sin, but surrounded by Jesus. I'm told that the body is majority made up of water. So the water is in you, it's around you. And that's a beautiful picture, I think, of what it means to be in the pool or in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now back to the text. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Now, henceforth means something has happened before that. A time of intense persecution, if you read the context of this text. A time when you can't buy or sell without a mark. And if you don't get the mark, you're persecuted. If you do get it, you're under a judgment of the Lord. But henceforth, after Christ has come and preached and died on the cross for our sins and risen from the dead and ascended into heaven, and he sees the intense persecution the church is under. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, henceforth. And then he gives a statement. They rest from their labors. If you read Hebrews chapter 11 and 12, it says, since we are surrounded by such a great host of witnesses, who having already run their great race of faith, sit down in the stadium of heaven. And they watch us run our own great race of faith, and they cheer for us from the grandstands. Don't quit. Just a little further. You can make it. If you go over to Duke Chapel today at 5 o'clock, they're having a Carillion recital playing beautiful hymnody on those... Uh, Dozens of bells they have up there. It's not to be missed if you have a moment around 5 o'clock. You can bring a lounge chair and sit outside or park your car there and roll the window down. Uh, it's wonderful. But if you look at the entranceway into Duke Chapel, it's built on the idea of Hebrews 11 and 12. Uh, you, you're walking from the world into the presence of the Lord. You're running your great race of faith. And surrounding you there are all the heroes of the faith 
who've run the race before you. There's John Wesley. There's Savernella, one of the early preachers of the Reformation. Huss is there, Zwingli is there, Martin Luther. Uh, Robert E. Lee was there, a, a great Christian from the South, one of our generals, but somebody took a sledgehammer to his face a few years ago in the Black Lives Matter controversy and he's been destroyed and removed. I think it will stay vacant for a few more years and they'll probably replace it with the statue of a woman. And there have been many great women of the faith who cheer us on. But the point is, when you're going into church, the saints of heaven cheer you as you run your own great race of faith. Now, he's talking about a track meet here. It says, we lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. Track stars don't wear helmets, football pads. They wear a pair of shorts, sometimes a tank top and a lightweight pair of shoes. They throw aside everything that clings so closely, and they run with perseverance the great race of faith set before them. Now the word race in the Greek is the word agon, or agonia. Uh, it's the marathon, a marathon of 28 miles. And the agonia is too long to sprint. It's just an agony to run it. And what Paul is saying, or John is saying in the text, is that life is like a great agonizing race. You know what Robert E. Lee's last words were? He said, I am so tired. And then he said, strike the tent, which means take the tent down. It's time to move on. Do you know what the last words of Stonewall Jackson were? His arm had been amputated from a war wound in Virginia, and he was delirious. And right before he slipped into the arms of death, he said, no, no, don't camp here. Cross the river and camp in the shade of the trees. Isn't that a beautiful thought? I am so tired of life sometimes, aren't you? I'm tired of cancer. I'm tired of birth defects. I'm tired of squabbles in the church that don't amount to anything except dividing people who belong together. I'm tired of underemployment and unemployment. I'm tired of government that lies to me. I'm tired of war. I'm tired of COVID. And the text lets us know that God understands this fatigue. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Yea, blessed indeed. They rest from their labors. Have you ever been to the beach at low tide? And your children or your grandchildren gouge holes in it. They have a picnic. They don't often clean up after themselves very well around you. The seashells of beautiful findings are picked over. And people carve their initials in it and their Jeep tires of the beach patrol that go. It's a kind of an ugly thing at low tide. But when high tide swells up and washes over all that ugliness, it smooths it out and cleanses it. And when the tide goes out again, the beach is new. It rests from the fatigues of former visitors. And it's new again. And what the text is saying is there's a tide in life called death that sweeps over your life and mine with all of our fears and rejections and hopes that are dashed, of all of our illnesses, and that tide of death doesn't just cover over us. It goes out leaving a new and resurrected body. And boy, how I long to be in that number when that day comes. Look at the third part of the text now. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Yea, they rest from their labors. And now one final thing it says, and their works do follow them. Do you remember the name Dorcas from the book of Acts? Dorcas was a woman up in age who was a craftsman with her hands. She made uh, blankets, she made articles of clothing, hats, children's clothes, and she gave them away as gifts. And when this woman suddenly takes ill and dies, 
The book of Acts talks about her memorial service where the people come around the Apostle Peter weeping that Dorcas has been removed from us to her place of rest. She's died in the Lord. And they are showing her, showing Peter the things she made, her works follower, the good that she has sown follower. Now, hear this with two ears, if you will. God doesn't need your good works or my good works, but our neighbor does. And our good works are for those around us as testimonies to how good God has been to us. It might be a book that you leave that you wrote that follows after you. Or it might be a solid marriage, an example of of love that you left to your children or your grandchildren. The children that are born to your life are works that follow you. Your grandchildren are as well. Some art object, uh, some career that you made or developed, a business that you developed. There are so many ways that our works do follow us. This time of year, when the sun goes down, about 6.45, I think, right now, do you notice that when the sun drops below the horizon, it's not like cutting a light switch off where you go from daylight to darkness, but there's a process called twilight, sunset, and sometimes it's the most beautiful part of the day. But when the sun sets, the sky is often painted crimson or pink or orange or, or different shades of blue, and the clouds can just literally be thrilling. And sometimes when the saints of glory pass away, there's a kind of afterglow, a sunset of their life, where you see more meaningfully what they meant to you in death than you took for granted in their lifetime. I was uh, in England in 1971 as a student of Shakespeare in the little town of Stratford-upon-the-Avon. And there are not many times you get to be a college kid and become friends with a professor. But John Crabtree, who made me a very wealthy man by teaching me Shakespeare, uh, he and I went to church together. I would sit about where you're sitting, and Shakespeare was buried about right over here. And it was a remarkable Anglican service, very Christ-centered. Uh, the preaching left a lot to be desired, but the liturgy was really beautifully and biblical. The hymnody really talked about Christ. The preacher just didn't seem to know how to do it so well. And Crabtree and I became pretty good friends during the months we studied together. He was away from his wife and lonely and missed her. I was a Graham, North Carolina boy away from home and a bit homesick. And that was a touch point in our life as we went to church each Sunday. Well, there was a sexton in that church named Bridie. Or people actually called him Old Bridey. I don't know how old you have to be for people to call you Old Pastor. But I hope it's a lot more years than beyond where I am right now. But Old Bridey was the sexton. He came early and cut the furnace on. He swept the church up. He took out the dead flowers. He would unlock the door and lock it. He was there to help with wedding decorations. Whatever a, a deacon would do in this church, Bridie would do in that church. Well, Bridie died suddenly. And he was so popular in that town as a kind of mildly handicapped man who did all these charitable deeds around the church for people, always a smile on his face. They actually called school off in Stratford to let the school kids go to Bridie's funeral. It was in a Friday afternoon, about 1 o'clock, and all of the shops began to close, and John Crabtree and I walked over to the church there in Stratford and found a seat on about the third row. And then the children came in, and they'd walked across the fields from every direction. And the fields were in full bloom of autumn flowers, ditch daisies and such. And they would pick them and lay them at the foot of Bridie's casket. And pretty soon his casket was festooned, just beautifully festooned with fresh flowers. And John Crabtree leaned over to me and says, Old Bridey sure has lots of flowers, doesn't he? And I said, he sure does. 
And then Dr. Crabtree looked at me and said, but I suspect he's been sowing the seeds of those flowers for a long time. What kind of seeds have you sown? Parenthood? Art? Winning souls for Christ? Being a peacemaker in the church? There's so many wonderful seeds that you have sown. But what if you're sitting there saying, but what seeds do I have to sow late in my life? I'm 72 years old now, and I enjoy the symphony, Beethoven especially. And about five years ago, I was in the symphony, and I said, look around, Catherine. We're the youngest couple in here. And I said, where are the young people discovering Bach and Haydn, Mozart? Who's going to be listening to this glorious music of the Reformation in 25 years? And it really was a concern. And so Catherine and I made a decision. We will try and never go to the symphony again unless we take a grandchild or a neighbor's kid with us. You know, it's expensive. It's an extra $20 ticket. But it's worth it to invite somebody to look forward to it, to go out to supper before the symphony, to teach the kid to dress up and wear a shirt with an actual collar on it. Or I love this bow tie here. I, and, and to explain to them the circumstances that Bach wrote this piece and how to listen to it. And that can be a seed you sow. One of the best seeds you can sow is to educate a young person. I work with college students, and I am amazed at how many qualified students who could go to college, who want to go to college, can't because it's totally out of their budget. And it's a shame for a Christian to die with a huge sum in his bank account when there's an opportunity to educate a person in a wonderful career of service when you had it in your ability to do it, but you didn't because you just wanted to leave the money sitting there piling up. Educate a child. There are so many wonderful seeds left to be sowed by people like you and me. Well, I'd like to close, if I can, and bring a little bit of William Shakespeare into the closing. The balcony scene, Romeo and Juliet. She came out on the balcony in all of her beauty in a moonlit night. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? He was hiding in the shrubs. He climbs up the lattice to the balcony, and they join hands, and they talk forever, like lovers do. Well, the sun is starting to come up, and Juliet doesn't want to be found with her boyfriend on the lattice outside her bedroom window. She needs to go in. There's a decorum in those days. And so they say good night. And with these immortal words, Juliet says to Romeo, Good night. Good night, sweet prince. Parting is such sweet sorrow. And I think there comes a time in our life when we let go. And parting is such sweet sorrow. It's sorrowful that we'll not be in their presence for a while. But remember this. Don't ever say, I lost my husband four years ago. You didn't lose him if you're a Christian. You know exactly where he is. What is this, I lost him? Just go ahead and be honest. My husband died. I miss him. It's sorrowful. But it's a sweet sorrow because I know where he is. He's in a better place. And I'm going to go and join him there soon. And yes, we will recognize one another there. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Let's pray together. We thank you for these tender words, Lord, that play upon the strings of our heart like a skilled musician that bring us hope and comfort and blessings and bring sweetness to our sorrow. Help us to dive in to the deep end of the pool of your grace and to totally abandon ourselves and our weighty sins to your ability to float us and cleanse us and spare our lives. Help us to look forward to hope for the great rest that's stretched out before us But help us, Lord, for the sake of our neighbors to do those deeds of kindness 
that follow and point to the grace of Christ in our life and offerings of gratitude to Christ as we give into the life of others. Train us to be such a people in this world that is terrified of condemnation, is terrified of defeat in their character, and is terrified with the annihilation of what's on the other side for death as far as they can see. Help us to share the hope of the gospel. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord uplift his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.